people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. It appears that Pakistan is next in line in South Asia to suffer the brunt of the economic mismanagement and a series of overwhelmingly populist decisions by successive governments. Following IMF's duress to take strong calls, Islamabad last week introduced unprecedented hikes in gasoline prices, triggering anger amongst the people in the country. Newly appointed Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, however, said the decision was taken in the larger interest of the country. For the record, Pakistan has been under economic stress for the past few years and it has been bailed out by one or the other ally on all occasions. Long queues have emerged outside petrol kiosks across Pakistan as the government last week brought in a sudden spike of around 20% in petrol prices to keep what it calls economic crisis at bay. The government said the move would allow the country to continue receiving aid from the International Monetary Fund. The new price of petrol would be 179.86 rupee per liter and diesel will be 174.15 rupee, said Finance Minister Mifta Ismail at a news conference in Islamabad. People, however, say that their livelihood has been affected massively by the government's decision and urge the establishment to roll back the call. In line with expressing anger, dozens of rickshaw drivers protested the price hike in Lahore. If petrol is cheap, everything will be cheap. If you are a poor man, you will become a poor man, or you will be happy with yourself. Why will he get his children? There is no less rate than 30 rupees. There is no less rate than 30 rupees. There is no less rate than 30 rupees. This is our request. Let's take it back to the price. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif defended his government's call, saying that hiking fuel prices was inevitable in order to protect his country from bankruptcy. Making a statement in Islamabad, Sharif said the decision was taken as the country is witnessing a difficult economic situation. The price hike had been the main issue between Pakistan and the IMF as a part of an agreement to withdraw subsidies in the oil and power sectors to reduce the country's fiscal deficit before the annual budget is presented next month. Dunia mein petrol aur diesel ki kimtein aasman ko chhu rahi hain. Tel paida karne wale mulkon se lekar ترقی یافتہ ممالک سمیت سب اس شدید معاشی صورتحال سے دوچار ہیں لیکن سابق حکومت نے اپنے سیاسی فائدے کے لیے سبسیڈی کا اعلان کر دیا جس کی قومی خزانے میں کوئی گنجائش نہیں تھی ہم نے اپنے سیاسی مفاد کو قومی مفاد پر قربان کرنا قومی فرض جانا کیونکہ یہ فیصلہ پاکستان کو معاشی دوالیہ پن سے بچانے کے لیے ناگزیر تھا Earlier, the IMF and Islamabad had reached a deal to release over $900 million in funds once Pakistan removed the fuel subsidies and hiked prices. The funds come from a $6 billion package agreed with IMF in 2019. 
ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan had given the subsidy in his last days in power as the country faced double-digit inflation, a move the IMF said deviated from the terms of the 2019 deal. About half of the funds out of the $6 billion deal are yet to be released, and it is not clear when the IMF review would take place. Meanwhile, the observers who have been constantly looking at the economic turn of events in the country said the government should not have burdened the common people in one go as this would affect everybody's life. Uh, oil prices increase makes uh, common man life miserable. It also stifles the growth of the economy uh, and it put impacts on uh, demand and supply. It not only uh, impact and demand and supply, but it also creates a lot of troubles for our common man. Everything is going to transport and that is only on oil. We also make the electricity on uh, oil and that is the electricity is also going to increase and I believe that uh, this is going to be a very tough uh, time for the Pakistanis. International observers had opined time and again that Pakistan was treading on thin ice when it chose the path of subsidies and populism instead of going tough to protect its economy. While some of them blame the recently ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan, others say it has been the principal policy of nearly all Pakistani governments over the years. And it has not just dented the country's economy, but the commoners have also been put at massive risk for their economic lives hang in balance amidst the looming crisis. Moving on. Despite government's repeated assurances, the protests in the island nation Sri Lanka are not dying down. On the contrary, people from all walks of life have come together on streets, amplifying the anti-government chorus and demanding resignation of the President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Demonstrations have also sought the repeal of controversial Amendment 20 of the Sri Lankan Constitution, which was brought in by the Rajapaksas to accord sweeping powers to the President as soon as they assumed office in 2019. In a bicycle parade held this week, hundreds of demonstrators pedaled around Colombo to demonstrate against the government. And before joining the main protest site opposite the presidential office in the capital, they too raised their demands of removal of both the president and the amendment 20 of the constitution, which entrusts the president with the overwhelming executive powers. After multiple analysis and country-to-country -country comparison during COVID-19 pandemic, blaming Sri Lanka's mismanagement for the current crisis, the citizens' anger has grown several fold and they say they are not returning their homes until the president steps down and a new government is formed. All of us feel that not having a very independent and a transparent constitution and governance is one of the main reasons for the pathetic situation that we are facing today with uh, economic bankruptcy and political anarchy. Sweeping across the country, the crisis has taken a toll on everyone, from middle class to economically weaker sections and from the urban office goers to rural farmers, all have been at the receiving end. Long queues for gasoline is a new normal in the country. The tuk-tuk owners, who are one of the most affected sections of the society, say their employment is shrinking by the day. First-hand accounts of the tuk-tuk owners suggest a 50% decline in their average income since the eruption of the crisis, with some calling the situation worse than what it was during the COVID peak. They say it is due to the combined effects of the lost time, currency depreciation and soaring prices of fuel. Uh, 
මේකත් එක්ක ගොඩක් වෙලාවට පොලිමර්ට වැඩිපුර වෙලාවක් යොදවලා තියෙන දවසේ ගොඩක් කලින් නැගිටලා gedara වැඩි ටික ඔක්කොමන් ඉවර කරලා ඊට පස්සේ මේ පොලිමර් එනවා පොලිමර්ට රෑ ආවොත් රෑට නිදා ගන්න වෙන්නේ මේකේ තමයි ටුක් එක ඇතුලේ තමයි නිදා ගන්න අපි ඉතලා මේ පොලිමේ ඉඳලා තමයි වැඩ ගන්නේ එතකොට අපි ඒක බැලන්ස් කරන්න පැය ගන්න වැඩිපුර දීලා තියෙන්නේ කියු එකට තමයි As per different media reports, Sri Lankan authorities who are in talks with the International Monetary Fund for a few weeks now will propose to borrow at least $3 billion via the lender's extended fund facility. A $3 billion deal would represent almost four times the country's quota with the IMF. The global financing body said last week that it was in talks with the Sri Lankan authorities for a comprehensive reform package however it hasn't specified the nature of the package being negotiated meanwhile ranil wickremesinghe who was installed as prime minister a few days back and now holds the portfolio of finance minister too has increased the rates of tax being levied on common people as well as corporations The government announced that the tax overhaul was being done to boost revenue a part of the series of steps being taken to restore economic normalcy in the country this decision too has suffered a major backlash as people say they are already suffering and the imposition of greater tax will only worsen their situation the government is trying to suppress the dissent through all channels both negotiations and with the deployment of a large number of security forces however it appears thus far that neither is the country returning to normal nor are demonstrations waning any time soon unless a miraculous support comes colombo's way moving on Amidst the growing concerns of deteriorating human rights situation in Afghanistan, the Indian Foreign Ministry confirmed that a delegation led by senior officials met Afghanistan's incumbent Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaqi to discuss the current situation in Afghanistan. India has sent several wheat and other grain shipments to pull the country out of the crisis that is staring at poverty and famine in coming times. Indian Foreign Ministry confirmed this week that one of its delegations met Taliban's top leader and the current Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaqi to discuss the current situation in the war-ravaged country. The meeting came at a time when India, through its extraordinary efforts, which include getting waiver from Pakistan security to use its road routes, has sent several thousand tons of wheat to Afghanistan. As per the statement released by the ministry the government of India will continue to have a productive relationship with the government and people of Afghanistan The meeting which was largely kept secretive in the first formal interaction between the two sides since the Taliban swept to power in Afghanistan in August last year Our team will be meeting with representative of international organizations as you know they are involved in distribution of our humanitarian assistance these international organizations so they are one focus area um team will try to visit various places where our pro programs and projects are being implemented but again would that be in kabul and outside let me for the moment um, you know avoid responding to that specifically for various reasons Poverty and hunger have rocketed in Afghanistan since the Taliban took power after the United States pulled out and India has sent food grains and other aid. Indian government has already dispatched several shipments of humanitarian assistance consisting of 20,000 tons of wheat, 13 tons of medicines, 500,000 doses of covid vaccine and winter clothing. In continuation of New Delhi's developmental partnership with Afghanistan, India has gifted 1 million doses of India-made Covaxin to Iran to administer the Afghan refugees in Iran. India has also assisted UNICEF by supplying almost 60 million doses of polio vaccine and 2 tons of essential medicines. The interaction also holds significance for it comes at a time when the Taliban administration has drawn widespread condemnation for its anti-women diktats lately. 
India is one of the countries that have gone an extra mile to empower its women. Observers say India can be seen as a role model when it comes to endeavors being made by the government to empower women and Taliban could learn from it. Only last week had the UN official expressed his concerns over the rapidly deteriorating situation in the country. I expressed serious concern about the deterioration of human rights across the country and the erasure of women from public life is especially concerning. Ever since the Taliban reached at the helm of affairs in the country, the human rights situation, especially those of women, have deteriorated sharply. The economic situation too has been affected severely with the US which is holding Afghanistan several billion dollars not releasing the amount citing the fear of resurgence of Al-Qaeda. In such a scenario, the government of India which has extended support to Afghanistan through multiple channels during previous dispensation has continued its all form of assistance. New Delhi has reiterated that Kabul has been a neighbor and a friend for years and it will continue to remain so despite the internal transitions in power. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. From tour guides to tattoo artists, some in Taiwan are taking shooting lessons for the first time in their lives as Russia's invasion of Ukraine ratchets up anxiety at the prospect of giant neighbor China making a similar move on the democratic island. China is growing military pressure on the island it claims as its own, combined with the conflict in Ukraine has a spurred debate about how to boost defenses in Taiwan, which is whether to extend compulsory military service. Some in Taiwan fear that China, which has never ruled out using force to bring the island under its control, may ramp up the pressure, taking advantage of a West distracted by efforts to support and equip Ukraine in its response to Moscow. Taiwan has raised its alert level but has reported to no unusual military movements by Beijing. An automobile exhibition was recently held in Yokohama, city of Japan. The exhibition focused on carbon-neutral automobiles and automobile manufacturing firms taking steps to curb carbon emission. The efforts of two of the world's top automobile production companies, Toyota and Isuzu, attracted attention. トヨタ自動車の方なんですけれど、あの、今、あの、例えばEV であったりだとか、あの、電動車の方大変注目をされてると思うんですけれど、あの、トヨタの方はあの、電動車以外にも、あの、カーボンニュートラル燃料ということで、例えばEFuelだとか、そういったあの
Originally, thousand carriers crowded into one Mikoshi, but to prevent infection, the number of carriers was limited to 100 by attaching ties to it. Asakusa is one of the most popular tourism cities in Japan. It is crowded with foreign tourists because of housing famous attractions like Sensoji Temple and ancient street shops. However, due to the new coronavirus, the number of tourists coming to the city has decreased from 30% to 2%. The Japanese government has announced that it will ease restrictions on the entry of foreign nationals and begin accepting foreign tourists from this month. Asakusa Culture Tourist Information Center is located across the road from Kamina Rimon. Its information staff also feels a positive movement of foreign tourists returning to Asakusa. Moving on, the government of India has been continuously endeavoring to clean and rejuvenate India's pious river Ganga. And the efforts have paid off so far as the BOD level of the country's largest river has decreased significantly. Today we bring you a report on how sewage treatment plants, awareness campaigns and people's participation is helping one of the biggest river projects in the world to succeed. Uttarakhand is a veritable blend of captivating sceneries which draw hundreds of thousands of tourists every year and its ever-expanding spirituality owing to the air, round flow of the pious river Ganga. And the national mission for clean Ganga through its flagship Namami Gange project has been tirelessly endeavouring to further enhance people's experience, both tourists and devotees, by working on mission mode to rejuvenate the river. In a multi-layered effort, the government has ensured that every section of Ganga in the state receives clean water. The key projects include intercepting major drains falling into the river and diverting them to sewage treatment plants. In Uttarakhand, as on date, a total 36 sewage infrastructure projects costing Rs 1,373 crores was sanctioned to create 195 MLD STP capacities and to lay or rehabilitate 184 km sewage network out of which 34 projects have been completed and the remaining two projects will be completed soon. This rapid rise in the number of STP installations has played a pivotal role in achieving the target of A category, that is, cleaner than ever before in decades with lowest levels of dissolved oxygen. Uh, we have now uh, uh, attained a uh, uh, high, very high quality of uh, purification of the uh, uh, water in there and so there is no sewage actually going into the Uttarakhand sector and it is uh, much beyond the bathing standards in Uttarakhand. Um, we intend to uh, keep uh, uh, the, the pristine river flow continuously as a part of the Agaral Thara also there and the Government of India has also been very, very, uh, very sensitive about the eco sensitive zone in those areas and we are in fact, uh, stock many of the, um, uh, uh, the hydroelectric projects which were also been taken up there. The Chamoli district which recorded a spike in untreated waste in the past few years now has 1.12 MLD STP in Gopeshwar. It successfully intercepts and treats water before it meets the river. This plant is based on an electric coagulation where 0.7 MLD is currently being treated. गंदे नाले डायरेक्ट नदी में मिल रहे थे गंगा की स्वच्छता को बनाए रखने के लिए वो गंदे नालों को ट्रीट के उपरांत ही छोड़ा जाना था उस बेस पे ये 1.12 MLD का STP दीनदयाल पार्क गोपेश्वर के नाम से बनाया गया इसका निर्माण 2019 में पूर्ण किया गया ये प्लांट बेसिकली इलेक्ट्रो कोगुलेशन तकनीक पर आधारित है जिसमें एनोडाइन और कैथोडाइन प्रोसेस से वेस्ट वाटर को ट्रीट किया जाता है। कसावन नाला, वन ऑफ़ द बिगेस्ट ड्रेन्स इन हरिद्वार डेट वुड कंटैमिनेट द रिवर सीवियरली, हैज़ बीन टैप्ड इंटरली एंड डाइवर्टेड टू 14 मिलीमीटर एसटीपी इन सराय। एनएमसीजी हैज़ आल्सो कंस्ट्रक्टेड सेवरल न्यू गार्ड्स एंड क्रेमेटोरिया 
Shiv Ghat and Chandi Ghat in Haridwar and Nandraprayag Sangam Ghat at the confluence of Alaknanda and Nandakini have been developed. To keep the ghats clean and lively, dustbins, solar lights and drinking water facilities have been installed. The National Mission for Clean Ganga with state authorities have launched extensive people's awareness campaign to keep the river pollution free. The efforts of the government are reaping dividends. Ganga is gradually restoring its originality, energy and sanctity. Efforts in other parts of the country too have brought similar results. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.